Good evening, everybody. Good to uh, be with you again tonight. I see my mother-in-law is watching, Anna West, Kayla, Janet, Mike and Charlotte, Bert and Shirley, Johnny Ashby. Good to see you all tonight. Let's see here, get that set up right. On this uh, August the 27th, welcome to tonight's study. We're continuing uh, for a few more weeks at least in the book of Romans. And tonight we're continuing in Romans chapter, chapter 12. We'll be picking up where we left off in verse 9. So if you have a Bible and you're joining us tonight and you want to um, follow along, let's see who else we got with us. Marsha Lynn, Marcella from Canada, Sarnia, Pam Shook, Connie Salvat, the Salvats, Connie and Rico. So yes, uh, Romans 12, we get to, we're starting to really turn to the practical implications of the book of Romans. A lot of practical instruction and wisdom tonight. And so that it will be a lot of very good, good practical uh, teaching for us as far as the Christian life. Again, Romans 12, 9 through 10. 21. We'll do the rest of the chapter. For those of you who aren't in Darmstadt, it's actually kind of gotten better today. It was pretty humid earlier in the day. Um, pretty, pretty humid, but uh, we had some rain and that kind of cooled things off again. Let's see here. I'll show my screen again what I'm doing tonight. Let's remove the sidebar. And uh, put up the window capture if that will work. There we go. So you can see again, I'm using my um, screen here to show my Bibles that I'm looking at using BibleGateway.com. And I have four translations I'll be using. This one is the NIV. Then there's the King James. Then there's the New American Standard. And then tonight I'm going to use the Young's literal translation because there's some very literal parts that bring out meaning that we don't get from some of those other translations. So those are the three or four translations I'll be looking at tonight using this um, great technology we've got here. But again, if you've got a, a tablet or a um, computer, you can do that same thing, create your own a parallel Bible using BibleGateway.com. Okay, well, as we go to prayer tonight, definitely want to be praying for, I know I don't do a lot of prayer requests because I know this is on, it's going to be on um, YouTube as well and saved here, and so um, just because of the public nature. But... Um, we have been praying, or I did mention, I believe, last week, Alan Fessmeyer, his wife Sharon, has been sharing some publicly on Facebook, and they're really continuing to go through a lot. So Sharon, I knew her as Sharon Fosdick when she she was actually the secretary at the chaplain's office at Deaconess when I was there. And then she married Alan, who was a student at one time uh, when I was there in the chaplaincy department. But Alan's been having a lot of health issues, and I think especially of them, and uh, they were very involved in the Wednesday Bible study that we have when things are normal, uh, and I'll be really nice when we get back to that. We've got such a nice room now, the conference room, where we are holding Wednesday by our prayer meeting. You can come and do that in person or join us online. And we do have our um, church board meeting, the council, and uh, the Board of Christian Education are meeting there. But I look forward to the day when we'll be able to have our Bible study there. We may want to, even when we do it there, figure out a way to, well, we can easily do it where people could join us by video. Uh, the time would just be different. 
So as we begin, let's pray uh, for Alan, but also I'm thinking of the people of Louisiana and Texas. I've noticed I, I don't spend a lot of time going through Facebook. It's just, uh, I just haven't had the time for it. But I have friends from college. I went to college, to a little Bible college for four years, where I got my bachelor's degree in San Antonio, Texas. And um, many of the students, well, a lot, not, I don't know what the percent would be, but there are many from Louisiana and from Texas. And so on Facebook, they've been marking themselves as, as safe, different people. So that's been on uh, my mind for sure to think about them. Good to see Robin Schmidt. And so definitely want to pray for the people uh, affected by the hurricane. And uh, also, I've had a lot of my mind thinking about uh, the um, unrest going on now, both in Minneapolis and then in Kenosha, Wisconsin, as well as other places. But again, um, I was born in Minneapolis, lived there for a big part of my life, and feel a, a real connection to both Minnesota and Wisconsin. So it's very, it's very sad to see these things going on. And I watched, um, good to have Leanne Wilner with us, Donham. I don't think I've ever seen you check in before, Leanne. That's cool. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so I, through the amazing, uh, technology of the internet, there's a, there's an app for an Amazon fire stick. If you show it on your, your TV and you can watch the local news for various cities that aren't your own. And so from time to time, I'll watch the news from Minneapolis or from Eau Claire and just checked out a little bit about the news in Minneapolis and, and to hear people say, you know, they've never felt unsafe really living in the city until now. And, um, and you could just tell it was very painful for this person who had lived there many, many years and, and what it's doing to that city. So we'll pray with these uh, these places that have been affected in mind. I know Kayla Street also has family in the Texas area. So would you bow with me as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. As we're going to read tonight, we're to be faithful in prayer, Paul will say, as he's giving the practical exhortations. One of the most important things he felt needed to be said is faithfulness in prayer, that prayer is something we commit ourselves to. And I'm grateful for the group that met last night as a, a, a corporate group to be faithful in corporate prayer. And uh, thank you that we can pray like this over the internet and be united in spirit as we hold up before you, Alan and Sharon and all that they're going through, that the presence of your Holy Spirit would be that, that grace in their lives. There's just not a better word for it. Grace, sustaining power. Paul said it is sufficient, that we should trust that it is enough. And we trust right now that your grace is enough for their need at this time. Likewise, Lord, we pray for all the people who are recovering now and looking at the devastation. And I've heard reports uh, that it looks like a war zone and I pray for grace. Thank you, Lord, that it's times like these that oftentimes we see the great good values that have been uh, a part of our culture and uh, our country, that value of uh, community, um, neighborliness, working together. These have been things that have been uh, a part of the very fabric of our country. And I pray, Lord, that these qualities would come out in the people there that are working together and, and, and those who will be there to assist and to give of their time, their talent, their treasure. And even as we seek to do the same thing as to give in whatever ways we can. And then, Lord, I hold before you those who are affected by the violence and uh, the mayhem and as the people in Minneapolis were saying, that the things that went on last night, that had nothing to do with anything but the desire to be destructive. And I pray, Lord, for those who would be motivated by that, 
that they would come to the knowledge of the truth. As we're going to read again today, we're to pray for our enemies, we're to bless those who curse us, we're to want the best for all people. And Lord, we want the best for these who are doing wrong. They are doing wrong. It's wrong. And uh, we pray, Lord, uh, that it would be brought to an end. And we pray for all those whose lives have been, the quality of their lives have been, has been really affected. And we pray, Lord, for reconciliation. And may we be agents of reconciliation, helping to cause a unity and a coming together and a working together as a people for the good of all. We pray your blessing, O Lord, on this study tonight, and we receive the gift and opportunity of being in your word as a great honor and privilege, and we humble ourselves to receive a word from beyond ourselves, a word that's able to get into us and to transform us. We receive it and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Romans uh, chapter 12, and... Right away, if you're reading in the NIV, for example, it says, love must be sincere. The old King James says, let love be without dissimulation. Dissimulation, just an older English way of saying um, hypocritical. And uh, then that brings us to the New American Standard, which has let love, and if you have the New American Standard, you'll notice that the let is in italics, meaning that that's not a word in the original language, it's one they're supplying as, as they're interpreting it to be implied. And then even the verb to be, let love be without hypocrisy. And this is a, a more literal, New American Standard is more literal. And so the NIV says it must be sincere, that's saying it in a positive way, in the sense of sincerity is what you're going for, but the actual word used by Paul was hypocrisy. Play acting would be the word that it was used in those days of what it would have meant. It would have meant playing a part and, um, and not being honest in what you're doing. So I'm looking, I put that up there just to show what I'm looking at here. So yeah, it's over here that I'm looking at the New American Standard, where it says, let love be without hypocrisy. But the be and the let are italicized, and that's that translation. And I thought it'd be good for you to think about these translations, what they can offer you in your own intensive study, and how they can help you uh, get a sense of what the original words were that Paul was, was using there. And uh, just making sure my volume levels are good, looks good to me. Um, so yeah, let love be without hypocrisy. Now, again, the, um, the NIV with the love must be is adding those words. Now, if you look up with the must, if you look over in the fourth column, it's the love unfeigned. That, this is the Young's literal translation, and that is a very literal rendition of it. That is, it's just, it doesn't even have a verb there, the love unfeigned. And it's the love. And uh, several of the, the resources that I studied brought out that this is very unusual to have the, the word T-H-E, the, the definite article. Now in Greek, it's, it's just a one letter, the eta, uh, because of it being a feminine word, agape, hey agape is how you pronounce the, the, the eta. Well, that's the word the, the definite article. And so it's speaking about a particular love. And so it's saying this particular love is meant to be without hypocrisy or, or in a very literal way, this love, its very nature is that it is not hip, with hypocrisy. As the young say, love, the love, no hypocrisy or unfeigned, as it translates it there. Um, it could be a way of saying both, if you're really acting in this kind of love, the love, it will be without hypocrisy. That is, you can't 
do this love. It can't even exist unless it's without hypocrisy. Then once hypocrisy is mixed with it, it no longer is this thing called agape. It's now something else. And so it's saying that this, the way it's, it's he's beginning. Now the other translations will say let because they recognize that in the rest of the, the paragraph and the rest of the discussion, he's going to be telling them what they should be doing. He's going to be giving them commands. And so because he's going to be giving them commands, they just assume that he kind of assumed right here that this was a command, that they're to love without hypocrisy. Um, but others have said, you know, what he could be doing here is saying that's the truth about this kind of love, and now the commands are to flow out of your having this love in your life. I want to uh, turn now to my, my notes. I also have my notes here. Let's see if I can bring those up. There's my notes, and uh, you see them there. It's a Word document. And uh, in these notes that I've taken, um, one of the scholars I've been studying, a guy by the name of James Dunn, talks about this, the love. What, what's unique about this love? He says, first of all, that agape, I think most of us have heard that word agape, and I think most of us are probably aware that in Greek, there are many words for love. Eros which is um, attractional kind of love. I mean, we get the word erotic from it, but that, um, that's, that, that's not what eros was all about. Eros was about any kind of um, attractional kind of love. It doesn't have to necessarily have to be overtly sexual. It could be that you're just attracted to that person, and that's eros, you know, boy meets girl, and he doesn't know much about her, but already he finds himself attracted to her. And it can be attraction physically, but also attraction to mannerisms and ways of being. But it's, it's that which is finds something in the other person that's lovely. So, as you might imagine, agape isn't about finding necessarily something lovely in the person. God loves us when we were without being lovely, while we were still sinners. So it's his love for us is not based in our being attractive. He loves even when we're not attractive. Nothing wrong with Eros in the Bible. The Bible celebrates. I've got these uh, Subot uh, fall type um, pretzel candies, which I'm liking. But the Bible celebrates Eros. Of course it does in the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs and um, celebrates it as a part of God's good creation. That that part of humanity that finds itself attracted to qualities in other people is good and that's meant to be enjoyed between a husband and a wife. Celebrated as it is in the book of Song of Solomon. Then there's another one which we'll be getting to that's actually mentioned in tonight's passage. And that's phileo, brotherly love. And um, Philadelphia, uh, that's where we get the city of brotherly love. And then, um, then there was one storge, which is familial love or parental love for a child. And agape, as this is what James Dunn says, it's been used so far in Romans up till this point only of divine love, only of God. And he mentions Romans 5.5, 5, Romans 5.8, Romans 8.39, and then of Christ in 8.35. 5.5 five is when the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That is, he says, through God's being in our lives, which has been opened up by Jesus. And if we, we'll go back and maybe look at this in a minute. 
because it, this is the basis of his commands to act a certain way. And this is such an important part of this passage because these commands are not based in something we do simply as a command to do uh, without there being something that has happened. Something had has happened that has made these commands a possibility for us. And that thing which has happened is Romans 5, 5. That agape, this divine love, which is the love God demonstrates is another, uh, this is 5, 8. 5, 5, it says, this love has been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And uh, it's this, having this love, both demonstrated in what God did and then experienced through the energy of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, the presence of God is the one who, who puts it into our lives. It's just making sure I'm not misquoting anything there. And that's exactly where those are found. Um, this is the basis for these commands. Oftentimes, um, you'll hear people say, the indicative comes before the imperative. These are uh, grammatical terms. Indicative means a state of being. That a new state of being precedes new commands. Imperative is do this, don't do that. They're commands. And they point out that in the Bible, the commands to be a certain way as a Christian are based in the fact that a new reality has come into our lives, a new being, a new existence. And the new existence here is that the love of God has come into our lives, been poured into our lives as an experienced reality through Christ being in us, and that he's the one who brings us this gift of the Father, the promise of the Father, the presence of God in our lives through the Holy Spirit. And then agape, that is our having been loved first in an unconditional way, not an eros way. Again, nothing wrong with eros in its right place. But God is being coming to us is not because he's drawn by anything in us. Because that's the whole point of Romans 5, 8. As I look here on this Bible, um, you see, this is Romans 5, 6. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And then verse 8, God demonstrates his own love. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the demonstrated... And first John, John will say, this is how we know what love is. This is how we know what agape is. Christ died for us. God sent his son and his Christ died for us. So this is how we come to know this God kind of love called agape. Um, he'll point out that also this is a, a love spoken of about the spirit in uh, Romans 15, 30. But here's, uh, here's what he says about the word agape, its history in the Greek language. He says, it is a long familiar fact that the word agape appears only exceptionally, that means not very often, in non-biblical Greek before the second or third century AD. Now that means over 100 and 200 years after this book of Romans. This book of Romans, remember, is like in the 50s A.D. So it's not until 100 years later, 200 years later, that you begin to see in secular, non-biblical Greek, people using agape as for love. And so, um, and then even when it is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it usually refers to love between a man and a woman. So that 
when it's now being used in the New Testament, there's this idea that we can see that what the Christians did was they took this word and they sought to use it to express their new experience of grace, a word filled with new content and significance by the earliest Christian experience of God's love. That is, they were taking this word, agape, and they were they knew it was not really a used word. And so they said, we'll, we'll make it our own word. And this will be the word to describe this new understanding of the divine character, that the divine character is this outgoing love that shows itself in sending his son to die for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This, this love that seeks and saves the lost, this love that's embodied in the person of Jesus, who will let himself be touched by the unclean in people's and, and biblically, they were unclean. You know, they were sinners. But he's showing that, he's, that he's, he's accepting them, not their sin, and he's loving them and he's not abandoning them. Like he'll say, Jesus will say in John 3, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he'll say that those who don't believe are condemned already. The condemnation's already there. By the virtue of your, your sin, you experience that you're at odds with God. You're at odds with the truth. But that what Jesus is all about is not bringing what people already experience through the law. He was bringing the reality of the gospel. Not that his being perfect didn't express law. It did. So I don't want to discount that. But the new thing he brings is this profound knowledge of agape. Uh, one of my favorite hymns, and um, that's going to be my question tonight in a minute, is about hymns. But one of my favorite hymns is that one, We Have a Story to Tell to the Nations. And it says, And to show them that God is love. And to show them that God is love. That this is the unique Christian conception of understanding of God that is different than, than what you find anywhere else. This permeates the whole of the New Testament, as John will say in First John. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and he that loveth knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God in his being is love. This is, uh, when I was a kid, we used to sing a, uh, I, songs I guess have had a lot of effect on me. We used to sing this song. It was based from the Song of Solomon. Seeing the Song of Solomon is also a, a, a picture of the love because you know uh, Christ is called the the husband and or the the groom, and we're we're the bride of Christ. So we would sing a song based on the idea that the Song of Solomon is also speaking about his relationship to the church. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. And his banner over me is love. His banner, I remember singing that, over me is love. We would sing that uh, over, I mean, that was a popular song, I guess, in the early 70s. But I remember as a child, that really, um, really got it into me. God is love. His banner over me is love. He is agape. And so they took a word. And they commandeered it, and they said, this is the reality we're speaking of here. And uh, the very, uh, and so this has been a long understood thing is what James done, a, really a pretty well-known and well-respected British scholar. Um, he says, the sudden explosion of usage in the earliest Christian author of Paul shows us that Christians found it necessary to make a fresh minting of a previously little used word. The subsequent use of agape by Christians for their common meal, they would call their common meal that they would have. Whenever they got together on a, to have a church together, they would always have a meal, and they called it an agape meal. They, 
And he's saying the very fact that they took that word and that's what they called their meal, a meal where they were together experiencing this new thing called agape. He says this underscores the Christian's own consciousness of its distinctiveness, that they took that word and made that the word to describe what do we do every Sunday? We have an agape feast. We are um, uh, entering into the divine love that when you enter into God in communion, because that's where then they would take communion. Because remember, Paul talks about how, in 1 Corinthians, how they're not receiving communion in a worthy manner because at their meal, some are going hungry while others have more than they need. Some don't have anything to drink. Some people are drinking too much because they're wealthy and they're not doing it potluck style. They're doing it where everyone brings your own food and you don't care about the other person. Well, how can that be true to an agape feast where that's, that's this, that goes against the very meaning of it all? And he said, that's why you're being judged here when you're taking it. So they were taking communion at this thing called the agape meal, the agape feast. But that was the word they used. And, and the fact that they did that, Dunn says, is showing you that they, they, this word was pregnant with, with meaning. You know, just really it was a powerful thing for them that um, what they had experienced in the fact that God had lavished his love on them as John will say, by, by giving his son. Or as Paul will say, you know, who, he who, who has not uh, withheld a son, how will he not freely give us all things? This idea that God has shown us so profoundly his nature in the, in the person of the man Jesus that we're overwhelmed with it and it fills our lives. It, it fills us. We're filled with agape. And I'm taking a lot of time on this because it, it helps us to see that we're not going to be called to be these things that Paul's talking about here in our text today because um, in our own strength. Let's see, I can fix that. He's wanting... Um, hmm. He's wanting us, he's wanting to show that these things are coming out of agape. They're coming out of that new power that has been shed abroad in their hearts through the Holy Spirit. And so, as Young's over here will say, um, the love, hey agape, unfeigned. The love, the, the thing that has happened and that is in our lives, it's, it's, it's not hypocritical. It's not phony. It's real. And if when it's in your life, it's not phony. It's not fake. It's real. And you know you're operating in the love. You know you're operating in agape. When, when you're operating out of that place in your being, where you're being real and not fake and you're not being a phony. You're being, you're not play acting. That's what the word hypocr hypocrite meant there in uh, that day. It meant to act a part and, and for it not to be real. And so, so on the one hand, I, I think the tra other translations are good. Love must be sincere. Let love be without dissimulation, as the King James says. Let love be without hypocrisy. But I like that, that real literal, the love unfeigned, or that the love not hypocritical. That's, that's, that's like the, um, you know, the sentence that is setting off the rest and uh, is the thesis sentence that then helps us stay, stay right in tune and doing the right thinking for the rest of the passage. And then he describes what, this kind of love does. In the NIV here, continuing on, love must be sincere. Then look at the next sentence. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Um, 
Again, I like uh, both the King James here and the uh, New American Standard. Abhor. Find something abhorrent. Something you you just it just it, it just goes against everything about you. Abhor that which is evil, and then cleave to that which is good. One of the um, resources I looked at said this is the same cleave as when Jesus will quote the Old Testament, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. They are to be inseparable. They are to be together. They're the family now. It's not father and mother anymore. That's not the family he's living with. His, his The sphere of his life is not lived there anymore. I mean, he's still in relationship with his parents, still in relationship with his brothers and sisters, but the sphere of his existence now is to be with his spouse. Well, that's the same thing going on here. You are to have the sphere of your existence be in that which is good. Well, that's I, when I was looking at this, I thought, now this is worth, um, let's see here, um, going in a little bit more depth. So I have my um, other resource here, which, which does... Uh, definitions. And uh, and it, you can see here, uh, one of the definitions is evil. And uh, the word evil here is poneron in Greek, which means evil or wicked. But then you get down to this, this particular resource here, which is called uh, the, bron uh, it's a, it's a four names there. It's the, it's the most premier Greek um, dictionary. And it says, wicked, evil, bad, base, worthless, vicious, degenerate, of poor quality, worthless, sick, painful, virulent, serious. It has that idea of all those things that it can be used for. And then when I, I click here, I have more resources. And one of the expository dictionaries that I like is this Vines expository dictionary. And it says, what I like about this, um, talking about, let me find the one here. Poneros exp expresses especially the active form of evil. Um, so evil actions is what this word really um, is talking about abhorring evil actions. And then it has clinging to what is good. That's, uh, let me scroll down here if I can get this to work. Good, yeah, there we are. And uh, this is the word agatho, useful, beneficial, good things. Uh, I was studying just recently a book by uh, a famous philosopher. He's the one who actually developed the great books of the Western world. I often mention that Reverend Jansen, who had been the pastor here in the 70s, in the first months of my being here, he, he was retired at this point. He gave me his, his set of all these great books of the Western world. And then um, that set has uh, two volumes where they look at all the great ideas that have been the discussion down through the ages among the great writers of Western society. And he has a shorter book called Six Great Ideas. And he talks about the good, that what Paul is talking about here. Now, Paul was writing in that world that had been shaped by Greek thinking, Roman thinking. So he, he thought a lot, and he was a very educated man, in these terms. And this idea that the good is that which is beneficial to a person, that which is um, these things that I just said again here, uh, beneficial, useful, uh, that it's what is goes towards the well-being uh, of the person. And we're to cling to that. It's, it's not a Again, the, the evil things are um, 
Let me find that word again. Poneron. They're worthless, degenerate, of poor quality. Worthless. They're not worthless to the human. Sick, painful, vir virulent. That's how the different ways it was used. You see, you see what's going on here is that good and evil are not arbitrary things. Uh, my son, Maxwell, he's started um, college at USI. And one of the classes he's taking, he's just had to work to get this class set up. He, he was rearranging his schedule a little bit today even. And he's taking an introduction to ethics class, which both my other children took at the same university. And um, one of the things they look at is they look at the ancient ideas of what is right and what is wrong, you know, and how do you determine what right and wrong is? Of course, like, that's what ethics is about. And some of the debate is, you know, are things good if you're a Christian? I mean, they have a, they have a, a part where they talk about How, how does religion work in all this? How, how does belief in God? And here they are at a secular university, and that's that's part of the, the different ways in which you're looking at ethical theories. And is it just because God declares it good in a kind of arbitrary way? Is that what makes it good? There's a famous, and this is in the book of ethics. I looked at both my other two kids' book on ethics when they got it, and uh, they had this, this dialogue of Plato, the Euthyphro, and this dilemma of, is good good just because God declares it? And is it just arbitrary? But that's not at all how the Bible sees it. Goodness is that which is beneficial to a person, which builds them up, which is, which is fitting, which is right, which is true. And badness is that which is not fitting, right, and true. Now, the deeper reality is, is that it, it, it reflects the character of his being, God's being, which is good. And so it's not arbitrary either because it's also flowing from God's own person. And God is the one who uh, gives shape to existence. And to be in tune with God is to be in tune with the power and, the, and that which is giving shape to existence. In him we live and move and have our being. If you're out of tune with him, and that's why... When we do wrong, we're in conflict with God, and it's not just an impersonal process. But behind it all is this knowledge that evil is evil because it's out of tune with God, and it just isn't fitting, it isn't right, it isn't beneficial. In the long run, it's degenerate, it's sick, it's painful, it does, does you wrong. And if you're full of agape, but you want the best for all people. And you want the best for yourself and for your family and for the world and for all of reality. Well, of course, you're going you're gonna to have a virulent reaction to that which is bad. You're going to abhor evil. But the background, again, is that you're being filled, Romans 5.5, 5, through your relationship with Christ and knowing the God revealed with Christ, you're being filled with agape. And if you're being filled with agape, which is not phony and it's not mixed with fakeness, it's unfeigned, well, then you can't mix it with evil. You know? Uh, then that's not agape. You're, you're, you're operating out of something else. And so that's why he says, love, unfeigned, the love. I mean, you... And so... But do you see, he is saying here, now this is in the form of a command. Uh, all of them show that. Um, abhorring the evil, cleaving to the good, is what uh, the uh, Young's literal translation says. Well, in some ways, it's like a, a descriptive. Let me see. I want to look at that. That's an interesting point. I want to look at that uh, form on my, uh, I got another uh, resource here, and I can look at the form for that that phrase there, abhorring the evil, what it is, what it is. It'll break it down for me, the lexical form, present active participle, 
Well, it's in the active tense. So it's saying, well, that's an interesting point. It's saying that unfeigned love, abhorring the evil, that is, unfeigned, this, this love abhors evil. That, so this is, again, the, 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 the English translations are putting it in the command form here, but in reality, it just seems like Paul's really just doing as a description of saying, this love in your life, when it's flowing and operating in your life, it abhors evil, and it cleaves to the good. And that's that's what should be operating in us that we're we're turning to the good. Um, continuing on, well, I'm really I can't believe my time is just going by fast. I didn't even get to my question yet of the night. Um, then he says, "In the love of the brethren, to one another kindly affectioned, in the honor going before one another." This is that very literal translation. Going back to the NIV. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Um, for, again, I, it's be devoted to one another in brotherly love is the New American Standard. As I studied for this, one of the things that was brought up is that the concept of brotherly love was also a new thing that Christianity brought into the world. This treating people who aren't your family blood-wise, or even by marriage, but treating a community of people that you belong to, this community, the church, as your brothers and sisters, and, and treating them like you do family, and they are family. That was completely new. Now, Jewish people would call each other brothers, but they didn't have the concept of brotherly love. A uh, few of the resources I looked at said, again, this was, again, this because of what happens with Jesus, this is a new thing in the world. Um, continuing on on that passage, I want to get down to where the next thing he says. Um, so you're to be devoted to one another, giving preference to one another in honor. That is, there's got to be this humility and this sense of one of the commentaries, one of the more famous ones by a guy named Cranfield, he said it's, it's, it's as if you recognize in the other person the body of Christ. And so you're honoring them because they're your brother and sister in Christ. And you're giving them a sense of whenever you're around them, how would you treat Christ? Well, you would honor him above yourself. You would you would go all out and, and give yourself and love for him. And that's the idea of this community. Remember what Jesus said when he gives his new command. A new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. And remember, he took the form of a servant. That's in the context of, of John, where he he's the one who takes the towel, and he washes their feet, and he honors them. And so continuing on, verse um, 11 Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Uh, the, the different translations here, the um, King James, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The New American Standard, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And then... Uh, the um, young, in the diligence not slothful, in the spirit fervent, the Lord serving. What I like also about that, that young's literal is it shows you that these were like really staccato, brief statements that Paul was doing, like memorable things to kind of describe this reality, the agape, that should be their community. Because remember, the passage just before this is, you've all got these gifts. This is what we talked about Sunday. And uh, and having all these gifts, use your gift out of the faith you've been given. Be true to your faith and share what you've been given. Be yourself and, and do it to the proportion you have faith and use the gift you've been given. Well, here now he's describing the agape that's not phony, it's 
in diligence, not slothful. It's not lacking in, in zeal. In, in the agape is a motivator, is what he's saying. That when the agape gets into your heart, when the agape gets into your being, it, it, it's your, you're the, you, this is the energizer bunny uh, that's in your heart and life that keeps you going. You know, we live in a time when people are concerned about the church. I, in fact, I just read an article, might have been on the Christian Post, and um, they were saying that because of this pandemic, perhaps one out of five churches will close because they're, now some churches are really doing having a hard time. Let me see if I can find that here. It's one of the neat things about this. And whether, I, I think that's pretty sure that's what it said. This is from the Barna Group that um, mentions this. And uh, it, it, things like that cause people to, to really wonder, you know, what's going to happen to the church. I read again where the Presbyterian Church in a, the United States, the PCUSA, <coughs> is... Um, is looking at no longer having their every other year national meeting because they can't afford it anymore. And it was saying how from 2000 to 2019, the denomination went from 2.5 million to 1.3, half the size. Now they mentioned that this denomination went in a very liberal direction. And so, uh, this really undermined a lot of their, their, their power. And I would say that's the whole thing here, is that the Christian faith lives from a living experience of Christ. And I have no fear that the church will continue to go, whether these other realities, other churches die. That if there is a community that is, is turning to Jesus and trusting in him, they're going to have an energy that's going to keep them going no matter what the, how the world goes, uh, they've got a, a, an internal power that's going to move them and drive them and, and push them forward. And that church will keep going, and the gates of hell, Jesus said, uh, will not prevail against them. And that's how I believe in the end the Roman church outlasted the Roman Empire and will outlast the United States and will outlast Western civilization and will outlast anything else. Because there will always be people who will be the agape unfeigned in their lives. And that they will not have, they will not be slothful. And they will continue to do the work and they'll have a power that keeps them going and keeps them meeting and keeps them alive. And there will be churches and people that will come out of this uh, pandemic and they'll keep going and uh, they'll, they'll keep the church alive. One of the things that this uh, David Kinneman of the Barna Group was saying about these churches that are closing is that some of them are finding that people weren't as committed to them as a church as they thought they were, which that was a sad thing because some of these are very old historic churches and this pandemic being closed is, is killing them. But that's the thing is, is that in the end, it can't be just, this was my family's church. It can't be uh, I go there because it's it's pretty, uh, got a beautiful building, pretty traditions. Those are all good things. I'm not against it. I love our beautiful building, and I love our traditions. But the thing that will be the, the spark plug that keeps it going is this experience of a reality that came into your life through Jesus. Agape. Agape love. So in diligence, not slothful, in the spirit fervent, the Lord's serving. The interesting thing about the Lord's serving here is uh, earlier in the same passage, you know, it says the one who uh, is uh, called to serve, let him serve. That's one of the gifts that's mentioned just above there. What was brought out in my study is the word here is not the same word as for a regular servant. It's the same word for a slave. So one of the translations that I was reading, they said it the Lord slaving. Well, that's like Paul. He always begins his letters, and I'm pretty sure he began his letter. Here I've got the New American Standard. 
and it brings us out really well. I'm pretty sure in Romans 1, he does just like he does everywhere else. He says, yes, this is the New American Standard, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. It's the word doulos, which means slave. So some translations will say, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. That is, it's, it's, this, it's this having been captivated by that person that you become totally surrendered to them. That's what he's talking about there. I've done sermons before where I talk about Pepe Le Pew, how uh, he would fall in love. Pepe, if you don't know for the younger people, I don't know if we have many younger people on this, but Pepe Le Pew was this Warner Brothers skunk who was French. So French are supposed to be known for love and he would fall in love with a cat and the cat would never want to be around him because he smelled like a skunk. But he would he would be so entranced by the the, the cat that he would just follow the cat around like a like a a slave. And the image of Paul is is that when we've been grasped by the love of God in Jesus, we're captivated and we 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 serve God as almost one who's been enslaved. I mean that that we we just are this one who loves him so much that we will just go where he wants us to go, do what he wants us to do. And you see, with this Young's literal translation is bringing out that the others don't do so well, but I, I think they have to do what they're doing in English, make it a command form. The Young's is bringing out that this is what agape looks like when it's in your life. This is what the agape community looks like. And when you've got a bunch of people who are that way about the Lord, about Jesus. Well, that church isn't going to die. You know? That 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 church is going to keep going and and Jesus said that church is going to keep going. I'm building my church and the gates of hell. So, uh, the way I always think about, I mean, I don't rejoice at the death of any local church or denomination. But Jesus did tell us that that his father would prune the 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 tree. And, and he, would, he would cut it back at times. And uh, when you prune something like that, you do it for the purpose of it growing back, growing back even stronger. So I have no doubt my own conviction is, is that the Church of Jesus Christ will grow back even stronger and will be made up of people, agape people, agape unfeigned people, genuine, filled with the love of Christ people who are being empowered and energized by a, something even more, uh, even greater than nuclear power in the, in the sense that it, it powers those submarines and they're able to go for, for a long period of time under the water because they have this nuclear power. Well, the idea being agape is in the human heart of the person who's coming to Jesus and, and experiencing Jesus. Which brings me to my question of the night. Um, I just mentioned that the way that I think uh, I know that I really have come to know that in my life, uh, reading the Bible is a big one, but Paul says we're to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, and then he says, singing to one another with hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart. And he's pointing to one of the ways in which this knowledge of Christ, I said, I even sang, I am my beloved's and he is mine. His banner over me is love. That a part of the purpose of singing, having a choir, special music, hymns, is that we're singing to each other the, the truths about Jesus so that we will come under the influence of agape. So I, I, my time is going fast, so I want to ask my question of the night. What is your favorite hymn? Or you might say also maybe just what is a hymn that really has spoken to you about God? And re-energizes you and, and the conviction of his love for you and of the of the gift that he gives you. And uh, if you have a moment to share that before we bring this to a close, I, I'll keep going. And if you can think of your favorite hymn, it'd be interesting to hear what, what favorite ones are there. I've just said some of mine. Um, we have a story to tell them to the nations. Telling them the story will turn their hearts to the right. The story of Truth and mercy, a story of light and the darkness will turn. 
but and this tell them that God is love. Um, in the garden, yes, that is that's a that's one of a, one of that's supposed to be about Mary Magdalene being at the garden and having an intimate encounter with Jesus, and then that is for us because He lives. Yeah, these are these are great ones. Yes, our own intimate relationship with God in the garden, and then because He lives. I can face love lifted me. Yeah, I love love lifted me, Mary Farney. Well, I, I really do probably like most every hymn. I can't think of any I don't like. Why me, Lord, and he lives, Marcella. Standing on holy ground, Johnny Ashby, yes. Know there are angels all around. What a friend we have in Jesus. Shelly Farney, good to have Shelly with us. Yeah. Old Rugged Cross, Kayla. Kayla Kuntz, wow, we've got uh, people jumping in there. Good to have both of you on there. I haven't had to say something before, fantastic. Yeah, Old Rugged Cross, really a description of what God did for us, what, uh, uh, what love looks like. I think these are ways in which, again, you think about it, he took the whole first 11 chapters, basically, to present agape, what agape looks like. He began with that, the whole world is amazing grace for Sharon Fessmeyer and trust and obey for Alan. Yeah, these are all great. But those first 11 chapters, he first three chapters, he shows how we're sinners. And then he shows what agape does for us, chapters 4 and 5. And six, Amazing Grace for Connie Salvat. Just a Closer Walk with Yeep Thee, Pamela Shook. Yeah, the, uh, these are great hymns. And now he's saying, out of that knowledge of what, of what agape is and how it came into your life, it's in your life. And I think, again, hymns are one of the more powerful ways to get the word of God in you, and, to, and especially as Paul said in the Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it dwell in you. This is the powerhouse that keeps you going. And the agape that gets in you, then it gets out of you and expresses itself in this unhypocritical love that acts in these ways, that serves God as, as a love Someone so in love that you are like you're enslaved and your spirit is fervent. You're not lukewarm. You know, it's in the book of Revelation that the lukewarm Laodicea is seen as, and I think it's Ephesus right before Laodicea, which has lost its first love. Dwayne Goble, I Turn to You by Christina Aguilera. I don't know if I've heard that one. But I like the idea of turning to God. And uh, excellent. Um, so yeah, this idea of, of um, getting that word of Christ dwelling in you through song. And uh, you can do it anytime. You can listen to, uh, I know people who like to listen to contemporary Christian music on the radio. Uh, people who like to listen to old hymns. They go to hear um, gospel people. We got that Ernie uh, Haas, I, I think I pronounce it, he, he's, uh, who comes and sings sometimes. And of course you got the, uh, the um, Gaithers who will come by and sing at times. But having, having songs that you're listening to, that can be a powerful thing, especially as I think about it in this pandemic of having um, having the word dwell in you richly through that. He goes on, and I'm going to just finish reading it, and we'll bring it to a close, reading it from this Young's Literal. In the hope rejoicing, in the tribulation enduring, in the prayer persevering. I just love this because unlike these other modern translations, and this literal is showing this is the agape, agape life. It perseveres in hope rejoicing, in tribulation endures, it perseveres in praying. It's it's and the other ones. It's a command, and a command is important. 
But this is a command that's, it's not, it's just a description more of the Christian life. And it's not something you're making happening so much. And it's not, it's, it's God in you through the Holy Spirit, through this agape in your life making you a, bless those persecuting you, bless and curse not, to rejoice with the rejoicing and to weep with the weeping of the same mind one toward another, not minding the high things, but with lowly going along. And then now here we got, become not wise in your own conceit. So you have an element of command in there, uh, which is there, which the other ones pick up on. But again, I love this. He's basically saying when the agape, and you get back, when you get and you follow the rest of this out, which you can do on your own, it sounds just like the life of Jesus, blessing those who curse you. And, and being good to those who are bad to you, but we're seeing that the source and the and the and the the power and the impetus for this is is not something you do in your own power. Because if you try to do this in your own power, forget it. Uh, I mean, there's a reason why people are like, "What do you mean, bless those who curse me?" Because that's just not that's not eros. That's not attractional love. That's not brotherly love. Even that's not family love but it is this new thing that appeared and is now in us through the Holy Spirit. Check it out, Romans 5.5. 5. Demonstrated by God. And, and again, remember the parallel to Colossians, let Christ dwell in you richly, singing to another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, is Ephesians, where it says, and constantly be filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit, it's in the uh, uh, continuing sense singing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So the same idea is, is this being filled with the Spirit is parallel to having Christ dwell in you richly, his word. And when you're living in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, then you're being given, how great thou art, Shirley Newber. Well, that's always a favorite for sure. Well, uh, so as we end, I pray that in fact, let me go ahead and pray that prayer. This is in Ephesians. Maybe I marked it in my other Bible here. Ephesians chapter 3. This is Listen to this prayer, and I'm going to pray it for you. This is what Paul prayed. O love that will not let me go. Yes, that's really a good one. I rest myself in thee. I'm thinking that's Caleb, but the green there is hard for me to to see what it is. Um, this is Paul's prayer. He says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, here, and this is in the King James, it's rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you, being rooted and grounded, your life rooted in that love, grounded, and it's like your life is is being held by that love. I pray that you, having your roots basically in this love and you're drawing your life from the love of God, that's what he's saying, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love which surpasses all knowledge. Wow. To know this love surpasses anything else that you, that you could ever know. If you know this love, this love that will not let you go, this love that is seeking you out, that is searching for you and, and, and is not rejecting you, but is wanting the good for you. It abhors the evil it abhors the evil in your life, but it's seeking you out to bring the good into your life, to know that surpasses knowledge. He says that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Wow. Wow. That, that is it, to be filled with all the fullness of God, is to know love that surpasses any other thing you could ever know in, the, in this world. I pray that you would know that, 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 the God, that the God of the Bible, which is the God of all reality, is this, is this the, the God of Jesus Christ. And if God is for you, and he is, 
and who can be against you? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I like that one. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And I'm guessing, I'm not seeing who the last one is, but oh, Marcella, love conquers all. Well, we'll see you again next week. You all have a good evening.